Welcome back everyone. In this video, I'll be going over the lecture for the derivatives of trig functions. In this section, we're going to very literally learn how to do the derivatives of the six trig functions, sine of x, cosine of x, tangent of x, secant of x, cosecant of x, and cotangent of x. Now, just like when we talked about the derivative of e to the x, it's gonna to have to be taken very literally, meaning when we do these rules, we can only have x or whatever your variable is inside the trig function. We won't be able to do sine of 2x or x squared or anything like that yet. Okay, but what we want to go ahead and do is start off. I want to show you how we can get the derivative of sine of x from scratch using the limit definition of the derivative. And let me go ahead and start by writing it down. If we wanted to do the derivative with respect to x of sine of x, what we want to do is we want to do the limit as h goes to zero limit definition of the derivative and we have f of x plus h since f of x is sine of x we replace x with x plus h we subtract off we do f of x which is just sine of x and it's over h All right now one thing i want to do is remind you of a trig function not, not a trig function, a trig identity that you may have forgotten about, and that's the sum identity for sine. It has some other uses, which maybe you saw on trig, maybe you did not, hopefully you did, but a big use of it is actually figuring out the formula for the derivative of sine of x. Now, I'm gonna pull that up on the screen. And you probably have, if you kept an a identity sheet from your own trig class, you might have your own identity sheet. But the sum identity here, because we're adding two angles inside of sine, sine of x plus h, we're looking right here at this identity. And it says sine of alpha plus beta equals sine of alpha times cosine of beta plus cosine of alpha times sine of beta. Now, we're just going to use this formula to plug in. We're just going to have x and h in place of alpha and beta. So I'm just going to use this formula directly, just a trig identity. We'll go ahead and do that. We get the limit as h goes to zero of, now sine of x plus h, we get sine of the first angle x times cosine of the second angle h plus cosine of the first angle x times sine of the second angle h minus sine of x. So if that was our identity and now I'm just doing the rest out subtract the sine of x, divide by the h. And what do I want to do from here? Well, this is where having a lot of experience in math would come into play. What I notice here is I have a sine of x and a sine of x in this term. Notice that there's nothing else in common with any of the other terms at all. There's not a cosine of h anywhere else. There's not a cosine of x anywhere else. There's not a sine of x, sorry, sine of h anywhere else. Well, because I see these in common in the first in these two terms, what I want to do is break the limit into two limits. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the limit as h goes to zero. We've seen this method done before. We have h on the bottom. And for the first numerator, I'm going to put the two terms where the sine of x is. Sine of x times cosine of h. Let me write it in the order that it's already in to avoid any confusion. So we've got sine of x times cosine of h. And then I don't want to write this one in this fraction because it doesn't have a sine of x. And then I'm going to have minus sine of x. And then we'll have plus the limit as h goes to zero. And then the part I didn't write in over h. So cosine of x times sine of h. All right, and you might be getting a little more comfortable with the idea of breaking apart limits like this. We just break apart the fraction and then distribute the limit to each part, which we're allowed to do with a plus sign. All right, so why do I want to do this? Well, what I want to really do here is make use of the fact that now I've separated in a way where my sine of x is in common in both of these terms. And why is that important is now I can, at least just in this fraction, I can factor out sine of x. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. We have limit as h goes to zero. I'm going to take the sine of x out. And what am I left with if I take the sine of x out of the top? Well, I have cosine of h. And then I took the sine of x out of there. So I have a minus one over h. 
Okay. Now this doesn't get an H over it because this is multiplication. I'm just taking the sine of X out on the top. And for the other one, it's already kind of factored for us. There's nothing to add or subtract to factor out. So I'm just going to rewrite it, but I'm going to rewrite it in a way that looks more like this. So I'm going to take this cosine of X because there's not an H in it and write it out front like I did here for the sine of X. And then I'm going to multiply. And what do I multiply to keep it back? the same sine of H over H? Okay. Now, why am I separating it out like this? is the limit as h goes to zero of this thing and the limit as h goes to zero of this thing. These are very special limits that we've actually seen before. But if you don't remember, that's okay. I'll remind you that the limit as h goes to zero of this thing is zero. So let me just write as h goes to zero because it's not zero all the time. And then the limit as h goes to zero of this thing equals one. Right. This one is popped up more often, so you may be more familiar with this one. But this is zero, and this is one when we do the limit. So when we actually go through this step and evaluate the limit, and we plug in h is zero, quote unquote, plug in, because we're taking the limit, sine of x doesn't have an h in it, so it's just sine of x. And then the limit of this thing as h goes to zero is zero, so I multiply it by zero, plus, and then the cosine of x doesn't have an h in it. I'm going to just do cosine of x times the limit as h goes to 0 is sine of h over h, which is 1. And if you simplify this, this is just cosine of x because anything times 0 is 0, anything times 1 is itself. And what we just established is what the derivative of sine of x is. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. The way we write that, if we want to kind of add it to a formula sheet, maybe you've been making one as you go. The derivative of sine of x equals cosine of x. So I just wanted to write this under here again because I'm also going to write down the formula for the derivative of cosine of x. The idea with evaluating and figuring out the derivative of cosine of x would be very similar. It's just that at the beginning here, you have cosine instead of sine, so you would use the cosine identity for adding angles. And I can actually describe the subtle difference when you look at the formula for the derivative of cosine of x is because there's a minus sign in the sum identity for cosine, you have a minus in between. We had a plus in between for the sine one. You actually are going to have a negative sign in your derivative. And the derivative of cosine of x equals negative sine of x. So if you go through and do the same exact idea, but with cosine everywhere instead of sine, you can pretty much think about having cosine where sine is and sine where cosine is, but there's a little more to it. You'd have a minus sign here. This would be a sine and this would be stuff that's cosine and it would just boil down to negative sine of X at the end because of that minus sign. Okay. And that's really what we determined so far. So let me just draw arrows. Don't necessarily need to rewrite it again. We now know the derivative of sine of x and cosine of x. Okay, and you really do have to memorize these. There's not necessarily a handy way to memorize the derivative of the trig functions. There is going to be a pattern that I'll show you, but I won't show you till the very end because it's not an obvious pattern and I don't think it's a good idea to worry about a pattern right away. Okay. So now that we've got the derivative of sine of x and cosine of x, we should probably get the derivatives of the other four as well before we start doing problems, because we don't want to just talk about trig functions and then only do derivatives with sine and cosine. Well, what's nice is that, let me just leave this in view for the moment. If you'd use the definition of the other four trig functions, like tangent is sine over cosine, cotangent is cosine over sine, and so on, then you can find the derivative using the quotient rule. All right, so let's just, I've kind of made this one a practice problem. This would really be an identity. We would just figure out the formula for the derivative of tangent of X and then use it in problems, but we can make it a problem. You could do all these on your own, just as long as you follow the pattern here. Okay. So what we have here, we want to do the derivative of tangent of X. Well, tangent of X is the same thing as sine of X over cosine of X. Okay. 
And what we just learned above, we know the derivative of sine of x, we know the derivative of cosine of x, and we know to do the derivative of a fraction, we need to use the quotient rule. So what we're going to do is use the quotient rule here. And then we'll be able to get y prime, which would be the derivative of tangent of x. So y prime equals, what's the derivative of the top? Well, let's just go ahead and write it down since it's still a relatively new rule. The derivative of a fraction using quotient rule, you do the derivative of the top. So we get the derivative of sine of x times the bottom times cosine of x minus the top sine of x times the derivative of the bottom, which is cosine of x. And it's all over the bottom squared, cosine of x all squared. All right, now just like last section, when we approach doing the quotient rule, simplifying, it doesn't matter what functions are in it, it can be trig, exponential, power functions, we just do it the same way every time. We simplify these two derivatives. So the derivative of sine of x, we just figured out is cosine of x. Let's go ahead and plug that in. We get cosine of x. We're supposed to multiply that by cosine of x minus sine of x. And what's the derivative of cosine of x? Well, we just established that's negative cosine of x. Sorry, negative sine of x. And then this is all over a cosine of x squared. Now, you should remember from trig the way we abbreviate that when we do powers of trig functions, if we put the power in between the trig function's name and the angle argument. So it looks like that. All right. Now, remember what I said about simplifying with the quotient rule is that you never want to really mess with the denominator until the numerator is simplified. So I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite the cosine squared of x. And how do we simplify the top? Well, cosine of x times cosine of x is also cosine squared of x. Then we have minus, and then when we multiply a minus, it'll give us a plus. And we have sine of x times sine of x would be sine squared of x. Right. Now, hopefully you recognize the top as being something familiar, one of our, your trig identities. It's the most important one as far as all the trig identities go. But one thing I want to point out here is that we have a cosine squared of x in the top and bottom, but because it's linked by a plus on the top, we can't cancel them out. So remember, we'd have to have a cosine squared of x in every single part to be able to properly cancel out. But you should really remember the identity here. What is cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x equal to? That's equal to 1. This is the most important identity to know. The three Pythagorean identities are the most important ones. And you should have seen when you went through a trig course that they all come from this. And when we do derivatives with trig functions, Pythagorean identities and other types of identities will pop up. Not too much yet because we don't have enough derivative rules to really implement other ones, but it's just something to be on the lookout for. However, the point here is that the numerator is just one the denominator is cosine squared of x. Now we could leave it like this, but we do have an easier way to write this as a formula because one over cosine is the same as secant. And since cosine is being squared, this is actually secant squared of x. And this is typically how you'll see the derivative of tangent squared of x in a formula sheet or something written, secant squared of x. Now you can do the same thing with all the other three trig functions and maybe just as practice, you would want to do them. Maybe you could verify that I am going to give you the correct formulas, but for the most part, I want to make sure we have these six formulas and then we can go through and start doing problems with them. All right. So what about the derivative of cotangent of X? Actually, let me go ahead and rewrite the derivative of tangent of X down here, just so you can have it all in one spot. The derivative of tangent of X we just established is secant squared of X. Now the derivative of cotangent of x, this is sort of where the pattern comes in. It's related to cosecant squared of x. Tangent goes to secant squared. Derivative of cotangent goes to cosecant squared. However, there is a negative here. And then when we do the derivative of secant of x, 
This is secant of x times tangent of x. Now, vis visually, it looks like to do the derivative of secant of x, you multiply by tangent of x, which is a good way to think about it. But you just really should remember this as a pure formula. The derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. Then when you do cosecant of x derivative, you have a similar pattern to secant. You rewrite the cosecant. And then I kind of always think about what derivatives. Tangent goes with secant and cotangent goes with cosecant. So I also get a cotangent, but there's a negative sign. All right, so these four rules, along with the derivative of sine and cosine that we figured out above, are what's most important. And in the next video, we'll actually start using them in problems. I'll see you there.